Well, uh, good afternoon. I promise to be brief. Uh, first, I want to thank I want to thank the, the Banco de la Reserva and um, the Reinventing Burton Woods Committee for inviting me to talk about capital flows. Uh, first, I was slotted to talk about China, and then Mark asked me, well, why don't you talk about capital flows? Because maybe he knew I was going to be a bit contrarian. <laughs> so uh, I guess that's what I plan to do. Uh, this is obviously an issue that is uh, very relevant today, has been relevant for a while, and I want to present the view uh, from Chile. And our view is uh, a bit contrarian in what sense that uh, we tend to have the position that financial integration in the end uh, with, little, with, little, with little use of capital flow measures and little use of capital controls is a sound, is a sound uh, way, uh, way forward. Of course, this has been uh, hotly debated, and uh, uh, I'm not claiming to have the last word, but at least this is the way we have been practicing this, uh, 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 this issue over the past uh, several years. In contrast, I have to say, with the 90s, where we had a much more activist position, and uh, some people still remember us for that. So uh, what is the, the agenda? First, a disclaimer, what I will say is what I believe is the view from Chile, but it's obviously my own view. And I want to give a brief introduction. Then I want to uh, uh, look at uh, one big fact about what I believe is a, about global volatility, which is the heterogeneous response across economies. And I, I think it has been uh, understudied uh, in the past uh, few years. Third, the case of Chile, capital inflows, capital outflows, particularly the role of pension funds. And finally, some concluding uh, challenges. So obviously, we know that volatility remains prevalent. Uh, this shows, the, on the left-hand side, a number of measures of market volatility and stock prices, exchange rates, fixed income uh, from the 2013 uh, onwards and we see how volatility has be, shows uh, significant spikes, then we see periods of moderation, and then we have volatility again. At the end, the last one is, is uh, essentially Brexit. And this has impacts not only on, on markets in the world, but also on the funding conditions for sovereigns in emerging economies. And that's a right-hand slide where we see the very broad a variance in terms of the emerging market spreads in, uh, in a number of economies uh, and how there are, there are spikes that coincide with this, these events. Um, on, the, on flows, this has also been the case. This is portfolio flows to emerging economies. We, uh, since 2013, again, we see periods of very large inflows followed by periods of outflows and, uh, and so on and so forth. There's nothing really today that allows us to think that this pattern of volatility will change going forward. Um, I believe that the volatility is, uh, is something part of the landscape, both on flows and, and, and prices. And the big policy question is, well, what do we want to do about that? Uh, there has been, Molly Oswald presented this in Ottawa as, uh, a, few, a, few, a few months ago, as two way, there are two approaches to this. One would be to say, given that we are in this uncertain world, what can we do to insulate the eco economies to this volatility? And one approach, which has been called a new view, uh, is that uh, a broadly interventionist approach, both in terms of foreign exchange intervention, capital flow measures, um, and others, might be a, a, a way forward. The second, or old view, uh, or less new view maybe, is that a broadly flexible exchange rate regime, coupled with inflation targeting, uh, does a good job in terms of insulating economies. Now, when one puts this into this, tri this, this the sort of a two, two ways of dealing with the volatility, one has to be very careful of what we mean by insulating economies to this volatility. Uh, many times we tend to fall into what one can, can say is a, the straw man of uh, stabilization. That may, there, is a, there is a policy mix that will allow us to fully insulate from what happens in the world. And I think that is a straw man because the really issue is not whether we can fully insulate, which I don't believe so, but what can we do to minimize the impact domestically of this, uh, of this, uh, this volatility. Um, as I say, from our point of view, the old view is the more appropriate one rather than the new view. Some people argue that the new view is even older and has been revived. <laughs> but, um, so, heterogeneity. 
One thing that is pretty striking, and I want here to, to focus both on emerging and on advanced economies. I don't think there is, there is anything special, particularly about emerging economies compared to advanced economies. And Pilar's uh, figure at the end showing capital flows in both groups of economies are very similar. So I think it's very important to take this into consideration. We take out here uh, the, the smaller, uh, or we take out non-German Eurozone economies because as somebody pointed out, they follow also specific dynamics. And here, uh, essentially, we're focusing on four episodes uh, of shocks to the global system. The taper tantrum on the top, then we have quantitative easing. The next slide, we'll have two more. And what has been the response two months down the road uh, of local uh, yields, local interest rates long term, and on the exchange rate. And the striking thing here is that there is a very significant heterogeneity in the responses across economies. Uh, so it's not like all economies are suffering the same shock and, and reacting in the same way, which is a bit maybe the position of the new view that we are all synchronized. But here we are seeing that there is a very significant heterogeneity uh, in the response of interest rates and exchange rates to these shocks. Uh, so we have these two episodes, then we have two more episodes, uh, Operation Twist and also the debt ceiling uh, debacle in, in the US. Again, showing the same thing, very significant heterogeneity in the responses. Uh, and we think that it's very interesting to look at this heterogeneity in terms of understanding why some economies react more on the exchange rate space or in the interest rate space and what determines these, these, these factors. Let me then uh, show some work we've been doing with De Gregorio, with Jose De Gregorio on this particularly this, this, uh, looking at this heterogeneity. So here, I'm simply looking at uh, all the economies in the sample and uh, what has been the, the, local, currency, uh, the local currency interest rate 10-year uh, bond uh, reaction two months after Tape and Tantrum. We could also do this for the other episodes, but I think this is most useful. And on the other axis, what has been the exchange rate response? So if one believed that the world was kind of a Mandel Fleming trilemma world, uh, probably we would, we would expect sort of a downward sloping relationship, that those economies that reacted more with the exchange rate did so because uh, they reacted less with the interest rate, or vice versa. And obviously this is not the case. We have a positive relationship. So taper tantrum hit hard. When it hit hard on the exchange rate space, it also hit hard on interest rates. Um, now, starting from this, of course, there's Chile right there, the little round uh, flag. Uh, what we do next is say, well, but is there anything special about the way these different economies have reacted to these four episodes, the taper tantrum, operation twist, the quantitative in three, and the debt ceiling, that makes them particularly different from each other? So, and we find that, yes, it is the case. So what we do is uh, we do cluster analysis. So we take the response of the exchange rate and interest rates and long-term interest rates in all these economies, in all these four episodes, and we simply ask through cluster analysis, can we say whether there are different groupings of these economies? And uh, of course there are, uh, as, as uh, researchers that do cluster analysis say, this is simply a new description of the data, it's not really a regression, but clearly there is a, difference, a different pattern. And what is the different pattern? Well, it's shown, shown here. There is a first cluster, which is the red countries, which are listed on the right, uh, which are the countries that have been hit harder by both exchange rate depreciation and also an increase in long-term interest rates. Then there's a second cluster in the middle, which mostly has reacted or mostly reacted in this in in uh, in the, uh, to through nominal exchange rate sh shifts rather than interest rate movements. And the third cluster, the green one, uh, is kind of in the middle. So again, this is simply a description of the data. It's, it's looking at countries that have reacted similarly. So all these different clusters have the characteristic that the, the economies have reacted similarly to these, uh, in, 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 to these, four, these four shocks. And now we want to say, well, or we want to ask, why, is there anything very special that can characterize these clusters? I'm not doing any regressions here. I'm just showing figures. Okay, because this is, the regression is part of the second, the second part of the paper we're working with De Gregorio. And if you want to contrast, a very simple contrast between these two views of what determines the, the different responses, one is first the integration and financial integration and opening of the capital account. 
and second, uh, fundamentals. So we'll take two measures of these two uh, dimensions that are very simple. One is how significant has been foreign participation in local sovereign debt markets. Because one argument is that if you are very integrated, then it might be the case that you are more sensible to shifts in global sentiment and your interest rates will react more. The other view is that that might not be very important. What matters is fundamentals. And for fundamentals, we'll take the sovereign rating. So it's just very simple. We have more detailed work on the paper that is quoted there. Uh, but I simply wanted to show you this, this figure. So taking the first one, how do these clusters re relate to the degree of financial integration? Uh, we do three measures. I'm showing here them. one of them, which is foreign participation in local bond markets. I have to thank the IMF for all the work they've done on this. There's a beautiful data sets that have quarterly data for a number of years for many countries. And essentially what I'm putting here is on the, on the x-axis is the response of the, of the local interest rates, long-term interest rates during the taper tantrum. On the vertical axis is this, the importance of foreign participation in local bond markets. And what you see here is nothing. So what do I mean? That it really doesn't matter what is the degree of foreign participation as a determinant to the magnitude of the response of local yields during the taper tantrum episode. And interestingly, the clustering is, there are some countries in all the clusters that have very high or very low foreign participation in local, in local markets. That doesn't seem to determine the magnitude of the response of local yields during this period. What about the sovereign spread? So here I do the same thing. I simply put the shift in the, again, in the x-axis, the shift in the local interest rates two months after the triple tantrum. On the y-axis, the sovereign spread. Sovereign credit rating, uh, 100 is AAA, and uh, 50 is BB+. And here the picture is much more, uh, uh, much more clear. The economies that have had a higher sovereign rating suffered way less in terms of the spike in their long-term interest rates. There are a few exceptions, um, which are the red ones on the top, in the, by the middle, uh, which is, uh, is Singapore and another one, uh, which are very peculiar. But if you consider the, the other ones, Chile again is the, is the brown one, is on the back here. The, there is a very clear negative relationship here between the credit rating the, or the credit, the credit worthiness of the economy and the magnitude of the response of local sovereign yields after the taper uh, tantrum. Again, there's no, there's no econometrics here. It's just showing pictures of these very simple uh, relations. Uh, one, I, I believe that one of, the, one of the reasons why this shows up so clearly is because we are not making a particular case about emerging economies. We're simply looking at a group of economies that includes both advanced and emerging. And the, given the, the, the integration today in, in, in different economies, we believe that is a, an appropriate way of, of looking at, at the variables and letting the data in some way give us the clusters or give, identify which countries react similarly, being them advanced or, or, or emerging. Now, let me go briefly to uh, the case of uh, pension funds in Chile to try to explain why uh, maybe this is the case in our economy. So. Um, what we have seen in, 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 in Chile is that periods of capital outflows and capital inflows have been counteracted very clearly by what pension funds have been doing. So you can see it here on the left-hand side and also on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, when you have capital outflows uh, from uh, portfolio, portfolio outflows, then pension funds tend to repatriate their holdings. When you have capital inflows, pension funds tend to have a, a movement of the of their, of their funds abroad. And you can also see it in the, in the financial account. So there is a very uh, counter-cyclical behavior by, by uh, pension funds. So let me just go to the, com com the coming challenges and conclusions. Just four very simple points. We believe that volatility obviously is here to stay. And the role of policy is not to fully insulate the economy, but rather to smooth the domestic impact of this volatility. Uh, rules which is really constrained discretion is better than unconstrained discretion. And what do I mean by this? Inflation targeting, fiscal rule, flexible exchange rate is what I believe is the way to go 
to achieve this, this smoothing. A sound and transparent macroeconomic policy framework will remain, therefore, of paramount importance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Okay, let's open. We are running late, but let's open. Uh